Now we're going to look at the judgment part of Zephaniah. Chapter 1, we see an interchange between universal and local judgment, which is consistent throughout the book. Zephaniah shows that Judah will be judged along as everyone else. But you have to ask, why is this interchanged in Zephaniah? I think it's to emphasize to Judah that they need to get things straight with God, that they can't be compliant and just think they can get by with their sin, that God doesn't care, or just to think that God's just going to judge their enemies and they're okay, even though they're sinning. But God is warning them that judgment is coming on all, but will also come on them unless they repent and turn to God. They won't get away with their sin. Let's look at chapter 1 and read verses 2 through 3. I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, says the Lord. I will sweep away all humans and animals. I will sweep away the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. I will make the wicked stumble. I will cut off humanity from the face of the earth, says the Lord. So God starts this book off with as the ecological or universal judgment. It's a picture of God completely sweeping away everything from the earth. But then in verse 4, the emphasis is placed back on Judah and Jerusalem. And in chapter 1, verses 4 through 12, there are four, ob I'm sorry, five objects of judgment. The first one is idolatry, and that's in verses 4 through 7. And God emphasizes in verse 7, He says, be silent for the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a, a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guest. And here it's mentioning that this day of sacrifice, which we've seen in other prophetic books. And who is it referring to? Well, it's referring to those in verses 8 through 12, that God is calling for judgment. God is calling for a feast of judgment. And the idea here that God has consecrated his guests it means to bid or to be circum, cer ceremonial clean. And this is from Strong's. And then we see in verse 8, the king's sons and officials are mentioned. Notice, however, that King Josiah is not because he was godly and God had promised that he would not see the judgment. So it says that they are all dressed themselves in, in fine foreign dress. Why do they have expensive clothes on? Well, it may be as to emphasize that they want to identify with the nations around them. They want to show their wealth. They do not want to be separated from the other nations like God intended from the original reader. Or they even want to show off and show their pride among the people. But when was this fulfilled? When were they judged? Well, we see Josiah's two of his sons were taken to Babylon and that two sons were Jehoshaphat and Elikiah. And that's in 2 Kings 23, 31 through 34 and then in 2 Kings 24, 1 through 4. Another object of judgment is listed in verse 9 and it is those who oppress the people. Another or the fourth object of judgment is listed in verse 11 and it's the traitors. And the final object of judgment is listed in verse 12 and is those who are indifferent or complacent. And I want to read verse 12. It said, At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs, those who say in their heart, The Lord will do no good, nor will he do harm. And this translation is the New Revised Standard. And the idea of those who rest compliantly on their dregs, dregs refers to the making of wine. 
While making wine, the dregs are also called leagues. They normally settle to the bottom of the storage case or bottles. You know, wine is processed over a long period of time and all these things normally seek to the bottom and then when the wine is taken out, those are left. But if the wine doesn't, or if these dregs don't separate from the wine, then the wine becomes thick and sour. And that's what God is showing the condition of these complacent people in Judah that they have caused Judah be, to be contaminated. They are settled in their sin. They don't think God's going to do anything about it. And so they're lazy and they don't see that God is going to act and will judge them. You know, and the same for us in the sense that it's so easy in our everyday to get complacent or just think everything will always be as it is, it is. But the day of the Lord or the second coming is going to happen. And we need to have an attitude of expectancy, as it says in Second Peter 3, verse 12. And sometimes I really need to remind myself of this. Next, at the end of chapter 1, in verses 14 through 18, we see the most graphic description of the day of the Lord. It starts off with an idea that it's coming near, it's coming fast. It emphasizes that it will happen soon. It's guaranteed. Its horror is described in words like a bitter day, wrath, distressed anguish, devastation, darkness and gloom, thick darkness, there's a battle cry, such distress on the people. Nothing can keep people from God's wrath. The fire of God's passion, the whole earth is consumed. A full and terrible end. So this destruction would be total and sudden without time for escape. There is no help, no one can save them. And so it's kind of this idea that we have the day of the Lord that covers history. It's always near. There is an appointed time, but we don't know what it is yet, but it's always there. We know the final day of the Lord is coming. However, behind this judgment that is described here, there is a promise of restoration. And as we know, always behind the clouds, there is the sunshine or the hope of restoration. So this great event, which is mentioned here in Zephaniah is talking about the second coming. You have a handout again that's listed on the website and it describes the day of the Lord in the New Testament. And it shows even in the New Testament there's the imagery of everything being destroyed, total destruction, no one's able to hide, no one's able to escape except those who are saved. So in the end, at the second coming, the unbelievers and the wicked get judgment, but the believers and the righteous get salvation. So let's look at chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. So this is what God is telling Judah after this description of this great judgment that will happen, this day of the Lord. Then God says to them, Gather together, gather O shameless nation, talking about Judah, before you are driven away like the drifting craft, before there comes upon you a fierce anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the Lord's wrath. So mention that the before is mentioned three times. Seek the Lord, all ye humble of the land, who do his command. Seek righteousness, seek humility, perhaps, you may be hidden on the day of the Lord's wrath. So here, Judah is given a choice. Repent, and judgment will be delayed. 
It's not too late to return to the Lord. The present is still before the day of the Lord's wrath. The day of the Lord will happen at a certain time in history, but they still had a chance to repent. They still have time. But they don't need to be stupid and complacent and think that judgment or that they will escape the judgment. Their enemies will be judged, as we see at the other part of chapter 2. But the same will happen to them if they don't repent. So God is a God of mercy. He gives them, He wants to give them a chance to escape judgment if they seek Him. And so what happened? Well, as, you, as we saw in Second Chronicles, that Josiah does seek God and repents and brings the people to, back to God. He has an assembly where the law is read before the people, and he made everyone pledge to keep it in Second Chronicles 24, verse 32. God did delay his judgment, as God promised him through the prophetess. And no judgment came during Josiah's day. Next, at the end of chapter 2, judgment is on the nations and then comes back on Judah in chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. Then Zephaniah ends the book once again focused on eschatological or universal judgment in chapter 3, verse 8. And next we'll talk about the restoration.